Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grassroots Communications, How to Persuade and View Advocacy. Today's presentation is hosted by Prairie Communicators, which is the North Dakota Professional Communicators Southwest District based in Bismarck. Um, my name is Sarah Mutter, and I am the Southwest District Chair. Uh, North Dakota Professional Communicators is made up of individuals employed in all aspects of communications. Our members work for businesses, nonprofit organizations, and government agencies, and our small business owners are freelancers as well. <clears throat> all are committed to the advancement of communications professions, the exchange of ideas, and the recognition and encouragement of our organization's membership. So um, before we get started, I just have a few tips for you as how to communicate today. Um, we are operating as a webinar today, so you all entered as muted webinar participants. So if you have questions, just as you entered your location in the chat, you can enter your questions in the chat and I'll monitor the chat during the presentation and we'll ask Jason to take those questions if he's able or I'll let you when, indicate, Jason, when you're ready to take questions. Um, you may also see that down next to the chat, uh, there should be, I don't think I have it on my screen, but there should also be a raise hands option. So if somebody sees that, go ahead and raise your hand so we know that it's working. Oh, and this it is. Okay, it's showing up over in my attendee list. So, so, um, so in addition to putting questions into the chat, you can also raise your hand and I can unmute you um, when we get to the question portion. I, I actually says allow to talk. So I will allow you to talk if you have questions that are too cumbersome to put into the chat. Um, so let's get started here. Our presenter today is Jason Matthews of Jam Strategies. And Jason helps organizations raise their profile and deepen their impact by improving efficiencies, revitalizing internal operations, and developing communication strategies that connect. He's developed plans, directed qualitative research projects, hosted planning sessions, managed implementation, and advised nonprofits, businesses, and government agencies. Today, Jason will discuss grassroots communications. His remarks will focus on advocacy, specifically persuading government officials and how individuals view advocacy. So before I hand control over to Jason, uh, just one last announcement. I wanted to let you know that today's presentation is being recorded. And if all goes as planned, it will eventually be on NDPC's new website. So you can refer to it later. Um, also, so any of our members who missed out on the presentation will be able to view it on demand later. So Jason, are you ready? Ready when you are. All right, I'm turning it over to you. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, I always approach these kinds of presentations with some trepidation because we're all communicators. And uh, uh, I always wonder, you know, am I telling you something you already may know? But I also find, too, in going to presentations such as this myself, that I always uh, take away something and learn something from the process. So, uh, my hope here today is that I have a few uh, pearls of wisdom or insights that um, either you've forgotten or are new to you and that you can take something constructive out of today's presentation. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I operate uh, JM Strategies. Uh, JM Strategies um, is a firm that focuses on a lot of my work focuses on strategic planning. I do a lot of strategic planning, quantitative and qualitative research, a lot of facilitation. I do do public relations and public affairs work. I tend to do that um, um, for organizations, a lot of nonprofits uh, and some trade associations. Um, today's presentation, I have broken it down into three need to knows. Um, what we're gonna be looking at here because there's so many ways in which and approaches that we can take to a topic as big as grassroots communications, we could really have an all day seminar on this. So what I wanna do is to break this down in the limited time that we have to break it into three areas. Uh, political communications 101, uh, the basics of advocacy, and then finally strategy 
and narrative. And with that, we'll jump right into that first part, which is politi Political Communications 101. Uh, I will, in full disclosure, let everybody know I am an adjunct instructor at Bismarck State College. I've been an adjunct instructor now for uh, 10 years, uh, where I teach American government and I teach state and local government. I also teach for the um, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. First, it was through UND, and now it's through BSC. And I always tell my students that um, you need to understand politics um, in in its most basic form. Not not just be not just the three branches of government. You need to understand politics because politics is all pervasive today. Uh, and this is political communications 101. And I always tell my students this, that you have the cycle of the political system, that you can start off here with supports, demands, outputs, and feedback, and everything in politics, in advocacy, fits along the lines of this, uh, or in these four areas of the political system. And I bring this up today because it's very relevant, because I've worked with a lot of nonprofits and it does strike me, um, it never ceases to, to, to uh, strike me that there are a lot of nonprofits that are out there, and this is not a criticism, this is an observation, where they don't have a political mindset. They are so focused on their mission and the good that they're doing that they feel as though that is enough, that people just give them the opportunity to tell their story. People are going to automatically support what they're doing. And especially when it comes to issues where what the nonprofit is working on intersects with policy. Uh, and what I'd always tell them is you have to develop a political mindset. So in this political cycle, you see the supports, the demands, the outputs, the feedback. Uh, the supports very simply are those values and beliefs that underpin the political system. Uh, I, always, I always bring it up this way. What's the first thing we all remember? What's the first thing we did in elementary school every morning uh, before, before right when class started? We said the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance tells you everything that you really need to know about the American system. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Um, those are our values and beliefs. They underpin the political system. Uh, beliefs in equality, fairness, you know, those are the beliefs that underpin the system. But then as we get into the political system, uh, as we evolve in different stages in our lives, we make demands of our political system. We have wants that we want to get back from the political system. And by placing those demands on our political system, the political system, the elected officials, whether that is at the federal, state, or local levels, they respond through outputs. Those are the policies and services that governor, government delivers in response to our demands. And then, of course, we provide our feedback. And the most basic form of feedback is at the ballot. Uh, is at the voting booth, is at the ballot box. Uh, but we also provide our feedback in many other ways. I know we have a couple of elected local officials on today's um, program here uh, who are joining us. They can testify to the fact that they hear from constituents at meetings, they hear from constituents through emails and through phone calls. And then the cycle repeats itself. Uh, and and this, is, this is really basic to understanding uh, I think advocacy in, in, in how the political system in America operates. One thing that most people need to understand, most nonprofits really need to understand, and this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone considering the times that we live in, where politics is just all, all consuming and pervasive and interrupts every phase of our lives, it seems like, is that conservative voters and progressive voters think differently. Uh, and this is the no kidding Sherlock award for the day for this observation. Uh, you know, we all know this, but in, in tying this with the system or the, the, the cycle of the political system, you see that each group, whether they're conservative or progressive, imposes different demands and they have different expectations from our political system. How do conservative voters think? Conservative voters generally want the following, and I want to emphasize generally. Uh, they, they like strength from their leaders. Freedom. Uh, we can define freedom in many ways, but freedom. Uh, individual rights. Small government. Free enterprise. 
And they're basically responsive to appeals to simpler times or back to basics. Um, you know, there, there is an appeal to nostalgia that you see a lot uh, from, from conservative voters and from conservative politicians. This stands in contrast to progressive voters. Again, generally, progressive voters want the following. They want empathy and understanding from their uh, leaders. Uh, democracy. Uh, whereas you see the conservatives talk more about freedom, you'll hear more uh, progressives talk about democracy, mutual responsibility. Uh, where conservative voters talk a lot about smaller government, progressive voters talk about, progressive leaders talk about responsive government, uh, fairness and equality of opportunity. And then this, you know, whereas conservative voters talk a lot about, or conservative politicians, more of the simpler times, more of a nostalgia-based argument, Progressives talk about this general belief or these aspirations that the future uh, can be better. And so you, you see these, these two groups, they're on different planes entirely. Uh, and so when it comes to government, which is what we're talking about at the end of the day with advocacy and what we're all about and trying to make our demands and get the, fee, the outputs that we desire, conservatives frame their message and they think along these lines of what government did to you or could do to you. That, that's so important that conservatives, whether they're, they're conservative voters or conservative decision makers, they think along those lines of what government did to you or could do to you. Whereas progressives frame their message and think along the lines of what government can do for you or ought to do for you. Uh, so this this is something that that um, is is I think incumbent on nonprofits or any organization to really to really understand uh, in its most simpler ter simplest terms. And of course, the common denominator at the end of the day always is emotion. And when you take a look at, in politics, it's the head versus the gut. Republicans, as somebody who teaches politics, Republicans are just far far better at basing their arguments and their appeal on emotion. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a master of it, uh, but Donald Trump has taken it to an art form, particularly in this era of social media. Uh, Democrats by inclination are more prone to make rational arguments. They're more prone to appeal to the head. I mean, a good example of that is the Republicans are very good at a slogan that you can slick, stick on a bumper sticker. Whereas the Democrats have difficulty putting their 15 point plans on bumper stickers. And, and, that, and that, is, that is a disadvantage that Democrats have. The most successful Democratic candidates are those that are able to blend that gut instinct and that reason. And, and two good examples of that are Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, Bill Clinton especially, um, because and I think one of the advantages I always tell people when it comes to Bill Clinton, regardless of what you think of Bill Clinton, is that Bill Clinton had an advantage that I don't think any Democrat has had since on the national stage, in that he came from a conservative region of the country. Arkansas. Yes, he was in Arkansas when they were electing Democrats, but Arkansas and the South is inherently a conservative part of the country. So he knew how to communicate and to connect with more conservative, most more conservative voters. And of course, every election year, there's always the postmortems by both parties on, and it always comes down to how do we connect and how do we communicate? Well, what you have to look at is the importance and impact of emotion. And this shouldn't surprise anybody that 75% of all political decisions, and I put pol po uh, political in quotes there, quotation marks, because the definition of political is broadening, is, is getting wider. I mean, you, you, we see this now with the debates over whether or not you should wear a mask. You know, everything is seen through a political prism today. 75% uh, is based on emotion. And so what, me, what that means for organizations, for groups going forward, is that the strategic imperative is that when you're developing your message, you have to develop and shape your message so that it will um, shape or reinforce the value judgments of your target audience or target audiences. And you should develop a narrative that is based largely on emotional appeal. 
this is this is controversial. I've 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 talked to groups in the past. I've worked with other uh, groups uh, as a consultant where they come back and they say, "Well, wait a minute here. You know, we've got all the facts here. We have all of the data points here. We need to emphasize that." And this leads us right into the basics of advocacy. And what we want to look at here, hold that thought when we're, you know, pause for a moment and, and remember what I was saying about we have all the data points and we have all the facts that we want to emphasize because this ties in directly with these next, this next area here. Uh, one thing I always tell people is that advocacy and lobbying are distinct. Uh, advocacy is about creating awareness. It's about creating awareness among decision makers with the general public uh, on the issues that your organization or client faces and why it's important to address those issues. Uh, lobbying is direct communication with any decision maker who participates in the formulation of policies and funding for your organization. They blur, but they're also distinct. Um, Advocacy, I look at it this way. Uh, when you're meeting directly with elected officials or government officials um, advocating for your, your cause or your, your purpose, uh, you know, that's lobbying 101. But the work that goes into that leading up to that moment, you're laying the groundwork with advocacy. When you're out there communicating with the public, letting the public know, raising awareness, you're advocating. And so when I work with an organization, when I work with any client, and I always tell the client, we need to do an inventory. Uh, and this is what you want to do when you, when you look at having to advocate for an issue or for a cause. You need to look at the resources. First of all, what are the resources you can control or that you do control? Then what are the resources that you need? And those are two different things. Uh, many times organizations don't realize how many resources that they control, or they realize that there are a lot of things they don't control. That's important. That's where you start off right out of the gate, the resources. What do you control and what do you need? And then the question becomes, because we're all stretched for time, and of course, so many nonprofits and, and government agencies and organizations are always stretched for dollars, how much time and energy are you willing to invest in advocacy. How much time and energy are you willing to invest in acquiring more resources? Once you answer these three questions, then you develop the process. What's the process? Then you identify who are the players, who are our allies, who are our critics. And you always have to come right back and ask yourself, is our request or is our ask reasonable? And that it's very simple. Is it, is it easy enough to, to explain in 30 seconds or less? And is it easy enough for somebody to understand? And, and, and you don't want to, and I know there's some criticism there, where you don't want to dumb it down because there are just some issues that are so complex you can't dumb down. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we all know as communicators how people are collecting information, gathering information, and processing information today. And, and while there are many tools at our disposal to communicate, connecting is a challenge uh, because people have pretty strong filters anymore uh, because of the world that we, that we live in. The fundamentals of advocacy. Uh, advocacy at the grassroots level depends entirely on effective communications. Um, that, that, uh, comes off as a no-brainer, but it is striking to me in the work that I've done, the number of groups and people that don't really realize that. They, they, don't, they don't understand that. Uh, and, and you have to lay the foundation by raising awareness. And creating awareness has to be always your primary objective. And what I always tell people, at the end of the day, you are your own best advocate. Uh, if you can get up there and you can advocate for your cause or for your organization, it is far better for you to do that uh, and have allies come up and validate what you're doing than if you're an organization that does have some means to go out and hire a lobbyist. And I know we have some who are on today's um, Zoom or on this uh, webinar that, that work with the legislature. I've seen that firsthand. I'm sure you've seen that firsthand as well that when lobbyists get up and speak in legislative hearings, um, everybody knows the lobbyists, they listen to the lobbyists, but if you can send somebody up there who is 
seen as an ordinary citizen or somebody whose life has been touched by an issue, that testimony, that validation really, really cuts through. And it cuts through because they have credibility. And at the end of the day, credibility is the only thing that matters. Uh, so, so credibility, your credibility is so important. Raising awareness is your primary uh, objective, but maintaining and building your credibility um, is, is so key. And then a few other, a few other um, tidbits here, fundamentals. You never know if you don't ask. So if you don't ask, you don't get. We all know that in life. That's with anything in life. Um, always preparing your materials, having everything organized, everything prepared to make your pitch. Simpler, of course, as we know, is always better. If you have allies, for all, by all means, use them, engage them, bring them in because they validate, they, they, they give you, they add to your credibility, your, your cause's credibility. When necessary, go outside for help. Um, that's, what, that's what we do. We provide help uh, to organizations, to businesses, to trade associations. It's always good, particularly if you're, if you're dealing with a, a cause, a nonprofit is a good example. Um, it, you're so close to the issue. Uh, it, in business too, you're so close to the issue, you're at the ground level. It's good to have somebody else that comes in from the outside that can take a look at it from 30,000 feet to, to see how things look. How does it strike them? That outside help, whether it's outside professional help or whether that is very simply sitting down and working with them and, and talking talking to them and asking them to take a look at, at um, how things strike them is, is very, very important. Uh, and then of course, whenever you are making any kind of pitch to elected officials or government officials or you know, whoever your target audience is, always observe basic courtesies. So the five rules of advocacy, uh, you boil this down very simple. Visibility, it, it's always about raising awareness. That's number one. Uh, number two, cultivating those relationships, establishing relationships, maintaining those relationships, defining the issue. Uh, and, and this is, then we'll get into this in a moment here, but, but defining the issue, defining the issue for, for the public, but also understanding where the other side's coming from, because invariably you have the other side. You, you need to know who your critics are. And, and your critics are also defining the issue. So you need to understand what their arguments are and, and have an answer to that or cut them off at the pass. Uh, and then mobilize and anticipate. Uh, mobilize your supporters, anticipate the opposition, understand where the opposition's coming from. It's always good to try whenever you can. Uh, and I think more so than, than at any point before, to try to think like the opposition, try to think like the other guy. Uh, why do they think the way they're thinking? What's motivating them? And then knowing how to target. So visible, establish, define, mobilize and anticipate, and finally uh, target. That then leads us to the the uh, third part of the presentation, which is on, on the imperative, uh, the need for strategy and developing a narrative. And I, I, there are two, I am, a, I'm a guy who loves quotes. Um, yeah, I'm one of those guys. I'm a history buff. So I'm always, I always read, I always seem to learn more from reading history or biography than I do from business books. I try as I might, I always seem to glean, glean more insights. Uh, from the examples of others. And uh, Jack Welsh, as we all know, the legendary uh, former uh, CEO of General Electric, Neutron, Neutron Jack, he always told his engineers, and he was an engineer himself, he always would tell his engineers and his executives, don't overbrain it. Uh, don't overbrain things. And, and you, I think we all experience this, where we're part of organizations or we're working on projects, and sometimes we have to step away because we really are overthinking it. Uh, and, then, and then Wayne Gretzky, the NHL great, of course, uh, was asked one time about the secret to being good at hockey. And he says, well, I can't speak for anybody else. But he says, for me, I always skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck has been. Uh, and those are, those are good words to live by. Uh, and, and they're applicable to, to advocacy and grassroots communications. Uh, so this ties in with what Neutron Jack was saying. 
when you are advocating, when you are communicating, and this doesn't matter if you are um, preparing to make a pitch to the school board, the city council, the county commission, the state legislature, or whether you're running for office, or whether you're trying to um, uh, raise funds uh, for a nonprofit to, you know, accomplish whatever goal you want to accomplish. You should always begin by realizing that you can never underestimate the intelligence of the decision makers, nor overestimate the amount of knowledge at their disposal. So never underestimate their intelligence, but don't uh, never overestimate how much they have, how much they know about the particulars. That's so important. The burden of proof is always on you as an advocate. You're responsible for laying out the case. If, if, if you lay out the case and the decision makers still don't understand it, that's not the decision maker's fault. That's your fault because you're responsible for providing them information and you have to provide them information that yes, it connects, but because of the way in which we filter information, you've got to present information to them from where they're at. Let's just be honest about it. From where they are, where they're sitting, if if you if they're in that conservative mindset, or if they're a progressive mindset, I'll give you a good example. Uh, I worked with an organization some time ago that was going to make a specific pitch. They were dealing with a social issue. They wanted to make a specific pitch uh, to a local government entity, and I. Uh, was dealing with this nonprofit director, a wonderful, wonderful person, uh, but was very, very self-assured, very confident. Uh, and, and we've all encountered him, you know, an observation, our criticism, had to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, the board brought me in along with a couple other people to, to give some advice. I was helping them laying out what I'm laying out now, giving some pointers. And um, one of the things I brought up was you should go out there and get some outside allies. You should go out into the, into the business community, talk to the business community, make some connections. Because they were going to a local government with a pitch for specific funds. They had a funding request. And I said, you also got to look at these elected officials are conservative by inclination. Uh, and and I, I, I like fiscal conservatives in government, to be honest about it. But they're going to look at it and say, okay, well, two questions. How much is it going to cost? And then the next question is going to be, um, uh, why should government do this? And this director disagreed and argued with us. He said, nope, we're going to get in there. We're going to tell our story. We're going to lay it all out there, and, and they'll, they'll come to us. They got shot down. They got shot down. First question out of the gate was, why do you think, I'll never forget this, the, the city official, why do you think the government tax dollars should be used for this. Why do you think we should spend the taxpayers' money for this? And, and that went downhill from then from then on. That, you know, this person was so close to it. They, they just felt, hey, I'm just gonna get out there, tell the story, and they're gonna automatically see how valuable this is and, and what a great cause this is. Uh, you know, so never, never underestimate the intelligence of decision makers or overestimate the knowledge at their disposal. And of course, the cardinal rule here, ironclad rule, perception is always more important than reality. You have to define the issue before the other side does. That's what we were trying to do in that case with that client years ago, trying to define it. Um, why is this an issue that strikes, that impacts people? They don't even know how their community is being impacted by the issue. You have to shape and reframe that, that perception. And strategy is everything. And then this comes from a guy who does strategic planning for a living. So, of course, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, but it's true. Strategy always has to come first. Your basic strategy must be to go where the decision makers are. Uh, the most common mistake that's made is to develop a message first and then make your strategy fit that message. You need to, it's the other way around. You develop the strategy. You put a, you put a plan in motion. It doesn't have to be a complicated 15 page plan. It can just very simply be on a yellow legal pad using one sheet, developing that strategy. And then you develop your message, but you have to have the strategy that, that, comes, that comes first. And so as you're developing that strategy, uh, and that then leads to developing your message, 
there are a few questions you should ask. First question is what value or what values? So what value does your organization or service provide to the community uh, or whatever, whatever the, the population you, you're serving is? Or again, going back to the, the way in which people think that political mindset, what values does your organization embody or does your cause capture? Uh, again, appealing to that political mindset and fitting within the cycle of the political system. Uh, next question, whom does it impact or who is impacted? Uh, who's positively impacted in, by the work that your organization is doing or will be positively impacted by, um, by what you're proposing or what you're advocating for? And then why is it important? Uh, emphasizing the organization, the service, the cause, why that's important to the community at large. And I think that's where, where some fall flat is, is you know, if you're, if you're dealing with you know, a good example on homelessness, uh, as we've seen an increase in homelessness, and I've worked on that issue with some organizations, is, you know, people ask the question, well, it doesn't really impact me. Those people live on the streets. They should go out and get jobs. There are plenty of jobs out there. And, and you're dealing with mental health and all kinds of issues there. Well, why is it that, that uh, how is it that addressing homelessness, whether it's in Fargo or Grand Forks or Bismarck and Minot, is important? It's important because it comes down to quality of place. It comes down to quality of life, quality of place. Uh, what kind of a community do you live in? Uh, when you're going to work in the morning and you see a homeless person on the street corner, um, you know, it does impact your quality of life in a community. Uh, and so you want to, whenever possible, always tie that in to the larger community or your larger target audience. So the necessity of a communication strategy, we all know this. We all suffer from information overload. Uh, with everything that comes at us, our attention spans have decreased. Uh, and our ability to filter information has increased substantially. And of course, I'm not even going to get into the cafeteria uh, uh, consumerism that comes into play here with communications, where you go in and you pick and choose the information you want to fit your bias or your interest. And that's the only information that you get without getting any other information that challenges your assumptions or where you're coming from. And unfortunately, communications today is really one of sound bites and catchphrases. And that's the way it's always been. Back in 1973 on the evening news when people used to watch, you know, the three networks at 5.30 every night, the average sound bite was about 23 seconds. Uh, if, if you can believe that, about 23 seconds would be your average sound bite. Now it's 10 seconds or less uh, in, in the news stories. So you have to be able to especially if you're at a public meeting or you're, you're being interviewed by the media, you have to be able to have your sound bite down, the, the key line, the key phrase that's going to cut through and make it on the clip, whether that's online, on television, or on the radio. And that puts an imperative on you to develop a master narrative. Uh, and, and the master narrative is so important because people will don't remember facts. This goes back to the point I was making a few minutes ago. You can have all the data points and everything that you have at your disposal. People don't remember facts. They will remember stories. They do recall anecdotes. And storytelling is so imperative. And, and one of the things with the way in which we're filtering information today and, and information overload is that fortunately it has put a higher premium on storytelling. Uh, and people see themselves invariably in their stories. And this, this helps people grasp issues. So a story begins a dialogue. And, and I, I often tell people that you should look at it from your elevator pitch and your core speech. That elevator pitch, that 30 second oral narrative that covers the most compelling elements of your story, that communicates as succinctly as you can what you're advocating and what you do. And it should always have uh, three elements. And as you can see here, I use this when I work with the North Dakota State or North Dakota Library Association. I wanted to use this right here to keep this, uh, I deliberately kept this in here because when you're working with local libraries, I always tell them address the value, the impact and the importance of your library. 
uh, you know, what's the value you provide to the community? How many people do you serve? And how important is it to the community? And invariably, when I work with local libraries, they always come back and they say, okay, first thing they always talk about is how many children come to the library right out of the gate and senior citizens, why? Those are the two populations right away that, that are uh, people automatically want to work with or want to support. Uh, then your core speech as you're advocating, uh, that one page narrative that provides depth and dimension to your story. Give examples, provide simple statistics, uh, easy to understand analogies. Uh, stories and anecdotes are so important. I'll give you, I'll give you a good example here real quickly. Um, two legislative sessions ago, the North Dakota Library Association, which I've worked with, uh, provided a statistic that more people went to North Dakota libraries in that given year than had attended um, uh, Minnesota Vikings football games or Minnesota Twins games combined. And it blew the socks off of a few legislators. And then a session later, one of the legislators came up and said, how many, how many went to the libraries this year as opposed to the Twins and the Vikings games? I mean, how did that statistic? It stuck with them. So, so that one page, that core speech, that narrative that provides further depth and dimension to your story. And so when you're developing that core speech, develop it by answering those questions again. What's the value Whom, or, or values? Whom does it impact? Why is it important? And then develop a paragraph for each answering those three questions. And you can always evolve on that. Uh, as time goes on and as needed. And then of course, uses and applications in a myriad of ways with newsletters and, and letters, presentations, uh, news releases, stories, social media, and of course, uh, email messages. But this, this provides a framework for uh, whether it's a nonprofit or whether it's a trade group, it provides a, a basic a uh, rudimentary outline here of, of steps that you can take and, and tactics you can use to, to advocate and connect. Um, and finally, um, we all know this, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. The five rules for grassroots communications brings everything together. Simplicity, short sentences, small words, credibility. They have to believe, believe it to buy it, provide that context and explain the impact, try, always try uh, to paint a mental picture, that visualization, again, that ties in context and visualization, ties in with stories and anecdotes, and then repeat, 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 repeat. And with that, I am done, Sarah, so happy to take any questions anyone might have. Unless if I put everybody to sleep, because with these presentations, <laughs> you're, you're talking to a screen. So again, um, you can put your questions into the chat or you can raise your hand and I can um, unmute you so that you can ask questions verbally. And while I'm giving you guys a second to think, um, I've got a couple more announcements. Um, we'll let, like I said, let, J let, bleh, let Jason take questions before we sign off if we have questions. Um, so Jason did share his slides with me as a PDF and I did have one person ask that earlier. Um, I will email them to the participants who tuned in live today. Um, and if you are watching the recording later, you can contact me and I will forward the slides to you. Unfortunately, I don't think I have a way to get them to um, absentees or without actively going in and monitoring Zoom every day. So, um, and let's see, we do have one question from Jennifer, a reminder, Jennifer says, just a quick reminder for us government employees that lobby is illegal under the Anti-Lobbying Act. Sometimes there's a fine line between advocacy and lobbying, which we're, I think, pretty much everybody that works in state government or Jason mm -hmm. having worked with, probably worked with government employees, you're well aware of that. Yeah. Um, so Maxine says, thank you for getting us the slides. Uh, Kayla's asking any suggestions for this upcoming session if giving online testimony. I know, yeah, that's something that's going to be a challenge um, for all of us is if, if we're presenting 
to the legislature and, and typically instead of being able to present in a hearing room, having to participate online. So maybe you've got some advice in that area, Jason. Well, I think uh, well, it's going to be a, a whole new world for, for everyone, um, especially for legislators to adjust to. I think it puts a higher premium, to be honest about it, on storytelling and, and being succinct and, and, and getting, getting those points through. Um, because there is always the tendency to wander. It's never been easier to wander when you're, when you're watching something online. Uh, and so I think it puts even a higher premium on, on just going in there. These are the three or four things I need to communicate and, and get that out there. I also think that it puts, uh, I was just talking about this with somebody the other day. I think it also puts a higher premium as well on mobilization and making sure you have your allies organized to complement what you're saying because and what you're doing and advocating through emails um, and through getting those materials that you can get into the hands of the legislators because I do see definite challenges there because not only is it getting up there in front of the legislative committee to talk to them in person, it's also then after the after the year, you know, being in the hallway, you know, you know, actually talking to them one on one, it's going to be very difficult this year. So I think it puts a higher premium on having your having your story down and having materials and having allies. But um, it's it's a whole new world for everybody. Thoughts on like following you thoughts on following up maybe after with them. I know there's some legislators that like to get follow-up emails or like to get emails. That's kind of how they gauge how they're going to vote on something. Yes. But I mean, is that going to be even more overwhelming? I mean, maybe thoughts on making phone calls. I mean, we all seem to forget that these these devices can be used for phone calls. We just think we text message and email. So maybe that's an approach to consider, leaving the messages. That, that's true. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the unintended consequence though here too, that you just mentioned. We're to the point that you're overwhelmed. I mean, that you're getting all these emails. I mean, you take a look at local officials who've had to be making decisions in response to the pandemic, and they're all saying, you know, I've got, you know, I've got, you know, 500 emails that I've heard from people. You know, how do you get through all of them? So, so there you have to again target target your audience and and have have your allies ready where you know which legislators you need to, that you need to, to target. But yeah, it's, I'm afraid, speaking of target, it is going to be a moving target, this legislative session, because of this, this new world we're in for the time being. Yeah. And a lot of, a, a lot end. of demands, a lot yeah. of demands. Um, so any additional questions? I've got a couple more announcements. And so if you've got additional questions, you can type them into the chat. You can also raise your hand. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that today's presentation was NDPC's last statewide get together of our calendar year. It's also the last free presentation of the season. Um, and by that, I mean free to um, non-members. If you're a member, we will not be charging for statewide presentations in the new year. But if you're not a member, it may be a time to consider becoming a member because um, we will be beginning to charge for these presentations starting in January. Um, and if you're curious, oh my my goodness, my organization doesn't have a budget for something like this. Our, our membership fee is actually very reasonable. On the local level, we start at um, $10 for the season. And on the statewide level, it's approximately $30, which includes the local membership. So it's a very affordable membership. Um, and this year we were offering roughly two of these sessions a month. So if you figure that you'd have the opportunity to participate in 12 to 15 um, educational opportunities in a year's time for $30, it's very reasonable. Um, oh, and Becky is adding, if, if you don't wanna join the national level, and if you'd want to join the national level, you can, um, it's a great networking opportunity. Yes, there is the national level of our organization is actually called the National Federation of Press Women and um, men are allowed to join, even though that's what it's called because it's been around for over, the organization's been around for over 50 years. 
Um, there's a communications contest and there's leadership opportunities at that national level and educational opportunities beyond the local level. And I think that's it's like 95, 96, Ellen, if Ellen's still on here, she's going to probably correct me. Um, anyway, I can get information about any of that to you. Um, I was actually, I'm going to quick, trying to multitask here, I'll drop that, my contact information and the state organization's website address into the chat. Um, so let's see. If I missed anything in my notes. Um, I know um, we're going to resume again in January. I'm not sure if there has been specific content determined. There probably has been, but I have not seen any sort of announcement. Um, Maxine's asking if all the memberships end December 31st, if everyone's renewal potentially a different month. Um, we are actually, that reminds me, yes, I do have another related announcement. Um, the other day, our statewide president, Sadie, who is who is also participating, um, sent out a message to the statewide organization, and we're actually going to be launching our new website in January, and um, that will help us simplify the renewal price process, and that should help answer that question for you as well, Maxine, because um, our membership is calendar year based. And I know we've struggled to um, consistently collect dues from people because of not having a good system in place. And so we're actually going to be switching with that new website we'll actually be contracting with, I believe the organization is called Wild Apricot. And that will actually help with our management of our membership dues as well. So. Um, if you've got additional questions, you can reach out to me and I can, I can resolve or ask about that um, and hopefully get that straightened out. And Danielle's got her hand raised. So Danielle, I'm assuming you want me to unmute you. So I'm going to do Amber that. Has a question too. Okay. Danielle, go ahead. Um, actually, no, I was trying to log back into the meeting and I accidentally <laughs> bumped that. So sorry, I had to take a phone call. All but right. No, it was a great presentation, Jason. So thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you. Uh, Pamela yeah. Knudsen asked a question. Uh, have you ever rejected a potential client? If so, I, yes, I have rejected uh, a few potential clients. Uh, you, you get, you, you always sit down. I, there's kind of a, there's a rule that I like to follow. And that is if, um, if to see how receptive they are to receiving advice is number one. And then a good, good rule is, is this somebody that you'd, you'd want to go have lunch with or, or possibly have a beer with. And if, if that's somebody that you just don't have that personal connection with, uh, it might be it might be best to 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 um, to not not sign on with them. But yes, um, I there was one client, um, for example, um, uh, was wanting to do so it was a, it was a law firm. They were wanting to do work out in Western North Dakota. Um, I they were from the East Coast. Um, and I visited with him a couple times. Um, and when the guy got on the phone and referred to people as monkeys, I said, we're done. Mm. Um, and, and that was, so yeah, I, I have, I have, uh, turned down some clients before. All right, Pam, anything additional? I did get you unmuted. No, that is a, that was what I was hoping to, uh, <laughs> get a response on. Oh, so thank you, Jason. Very interesting. Thanks. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Um, well, I will sign off then. Um, we'll thank Jason for presenting today um, and thank everyone for participating, whether you were participating live or whether you're now watching the recording. Um, happy holidays to everyone, and I look forward to connecting with you in the new year. So, 2020 is almost over. Almost. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.